California state not-for-profit um, organization. Um, thank you for recording. Um, a California state not-for-profit organization uh, that has a broad economic and mission um, and housing stability uh, and housing justice uh, mission. We have a wide scope of services and um, one of our um, areas of practice is related to tenants' rights. Um, and so today we're gonna be talking about one um, component of tenants' rights and that's specifically the rights of individuals who are survivors of um, domestic violence as well as other types of violence um, to be able to break their lease early without the traditional penalties that might be asso associated with an early lease breaking. So the purpose of this presentation is for individuals to learn about their legal rights to end a lease without penalty if the person on the lease, a household member, or an immediate family member is a survivor of domestic violence, a survivor of elder abuse, stalking, human trafficking, or and or certain types of violent crime. The statute we will be talking about a lot today is the uh, California Civil Code section 1946.7. And this statute is extremely important because it enables survivors to break their lease early um, so that they can potentially escape a dangerous situation. And it also enables them to avoid any sort of economic obligations that might come otherwise with breaking your lease early. So it removes barriers that survivors or individuals who have faced sort of violent crimes might feel um, to moving out of a property that they don't feel safe in any longer. It, um, this civil code section removes those barriers so that that individual can make the decision to move out if that is appropriate for them. Um, and yes, without these protections, breaking the lease early could have serious consequences for survivors' financial stability, including affecting their credit score, um, affecting their ability to find a new safe place to live, um, and just having other financial repercussions and administrative headaches that they have to deal with. So without the civil code section, it would otherwise be pretty challenging for someone who desperately needs help to be able to break their lease cleanly. So let's go into this California Civil Code section a little bit more. So 1946.7, again, is the main law in California that allows survivors to break their lease early without the traditional penalties that we might see for an early lease termination. This section though are, uh, contains strict procedures that a tenant has to follow in order to benefit from the, this section and this law's protections. And one of the main ones is that the tenant has to give the landlord at least 14 days written notice of their intent to terminate a lease, even if the lease is operative or still binding for another several months. The tenant, if they follow that procedure and give 14 days notice and the proper documentation, they will only be on the hook for the next 14 days of payment of rent. Um, important, the tenant who can break their lease early under this law does not necessarily need to be the one who is a survivor or the one who suffered um, any sort of abuse or violence. The tenant uh, or the person who's on the lease um, can use this code section if they have an immediate family member who is a survivor or someone who's suffered abuse or violence or a household member, like a roommate, they can also use this um, uh, civil code section to terminate the lease, even if they are not, the person on the lease is not the individual who is directly um, uh, harmed by any sort of violence or abuse. So who does civil code 1946.7 apply to? Um, well, we just talked about, um, how a person on a lease that it doesn't need to be that individual who has suffered this type of harm. But generally the law applies to not only domestic violence situations, but also to um, tenants where there's an individual who is a survivor of the following types of acts, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking, elder dependent abuse, crimes causing bodily injury or death, crimes involving a gun or any other deadly weapon or instrument, and crimes involving the use of force against the victim or threat of force. 
So we might be inclined to think that this civil code section will only apply to women because women are disproportionately um, victims and survivors of domestic violence. However, the code section is very broad and could apply to anyone. So if you um, face abuse um, by your roommate and um, the roommate ha either committed a crime that caused you bodily injury or committed a crime with a deadly weapon um, or used any force against you, you could likely use civil code section 1946.7 to break your lease and get out of that situation. So although the original intent of this law was to protect, protect survivors of domestic violence, it is very broad and can apply to many different people in many different situations. So how is domestic violence, since that is a large component of this law and the purpose of the law to protect individuals who suffer domestic violence, how is it defined? So in California, domestic violence is defined under the family code. And it is defined as abuse that is perpetrated against any of the following individuals, spouse or a former spouse, a cohabitant, a person who um, is or was dating or engaged to the abuser, an individual with whom the abuser has a child, a child who is the subject of um, a, attempts by an abuser to establish their parentage, and essentially any other relative. Um, how is domestic violence and abuse um, defined further? So domestic violence and abuse is not limited to acts involving physical violence or abuse. And this is obviously a very common misconception. People think, oh, well, I have only lived with an individual or have an individual in my life who controls every move of mine. So that doesn't rise to the level of domestic violence or domestic abuse. But that is incorrect. California law broadly defines domestic violence and abuse to include those types of scenarios that don't actually um, implicate physical violence. So an example is emotional or verbal abuse or control, financial control, where the abuser doesn't let um, an individual have access to their own sources of financial stability or money. A violation of a restraining order could be considered domestic violence. So if someone has a stay away order and their um, abuser violates that by coming too close to them, even if that person hasn't been physically abused in that moment or um, perceivably hasn't been controlled in that moment, that would still qualify as domestic violence. Sexual assault, of course, is considered domestic violence or abuse and stalking and harassment would also be considered. So again, you see that it's very broad, the types of abuse that could give someone protections um, under the civil code section to break the lease and the types of persons who are protected by this law. Um, so it's important that anyone who thinks that they could um, be someone who is protected by the law to look into it a little bit further because more likely than not, they are given how broad the law's protections um, reach, how broadly they reach. So just to further define what California law or how California law defines domestic violence and abuse. So it can be considered um, behavior that intentionally or recklessly causes or attempts to cause bodily injury, again, sexual assault. It can be behavior that places a person in fear of serious bodily injury, even if that bodily injury does not occur. It can be behavior that has been or could be prohibited by any, any part of family code section 6320. Example, again, is harassment, stalking, or disturbing the peace, kind of a catch-all concept and a catch-all phrase. Um, again, re to reiterate this hugely important point, California law makes it very clear that abuse um, and the type of abuse in an individual um, has to suffer in order to invoke the right to break the lease early is not limited to actual infliction of physical injuries or assault. It can be something that's um, sort of quieter than that, a little more nefarious because it's not as obvious to the eye. So important to remember that in order to get the protections of the civil code section we're talking about today to break the lease early, you do not need to be someone who has suffered actual physical abuse.
Um, so we talked a second ago about disturbing the peace, and that is kind of a general catch-all phrase that encompasses a lot of different behaviors and um, uh, is a way for survivors to be able to get these protections without having to jump through a ton of hoops to prove that their abuser is um, abusing them. So disturbing the peace means uh, a course of conduct. This is kind of the legally definition a course of conduct that destroys the mental and emotional calm of a person. I think it's pretty powerful, even though it has kind of a legal um, tinge to it. So examples are sending someone many unwanted text messages or unwanted phone calls, sharing that person's personal or private information without their permission, trespassing, um, coming to their home, going to their place of work, appearing at a gathering uninvited, um, doing that to any of the victim's children could even count. And then again, importantly, violating a pre-existing protective restraining order. But once again, important to turn back to um, the sort of breadth of these laws, a course of conduct that destroys the mental and emotional calm of a person. Unfortunately, we cannot think of every scenario that someone might use to disturb the peace and destroy the mental and emotional calm of the person that they're abusing which is a very tragic um, state of affairs. But given the breadth of um, this definition, I think in most cases, someone would be able to demonstrate that an abusive behavior, even if it doesn't fall under this list of examples, could potentially be behavior that rises to the level of destroying the mental and emotional calm of a, the, the abused individual. Um, financial abuse, we talked a little bit about that sort of controlling behavior being defined as domestic violence and abuse, um, but more direct financial abuse is qualified as domestic violence. And if an individual suffers this type of financial abuse, they can invoke the protections of the civil code to break their lease early. So financial abuse can look like your abuser not allowing you to work, withholding money from you, taking out credit in your name and running up a large debt on joint credit or in credit in your name without your permission, stealing money from you, threatening to cut off economic support um, unless the abused individual um, does everything that the abuser wants or says, and just generally controlling your finances in a way that doesn't give you as the abused individual autonomy over your financial health and well-being. So again, domestic violence does not need to be just physical violence. It can be something like this, financial abuse, where you do not have the control over your own finances um, because an abuser is uh, exerting their power. Another example of what domestic violence can look like. Um, so coercive control is a, a new sort of term and law that went into effect in January of 2021. Um, and coercive control states that domestic viol violence can be a pattern of behavior that unreasonably interferes with a person's free will and personal liberty. and includes things like isolating a victim from friends, relatives, or sources of support. Um, so again, this new law that was passed in 2021 really reflects the good work that California's legislature has done to try to encompass all of the different ways people can be um, abused in a domestic violence scenario. So again, trying to get away from the narrative that you are only a survivor if you've suffered physical abuse against you or your family members and going toward and showing that there are many different ways that an individual can be a victim of abuse and many different ways that an individual can, even if they have the tragic circumstance of being a victim of abuse, um, they have are in, are, and are able to uh, invoke the protections that California has passed for individuals who suffer this kind of um, terrible hardship. So coercive control can look like, again, isolating someone from their family, friends, or support systems by not allowing them to communicate with those support systems, not allowing them to leave to visit those support systems, not allowing them to leave the house at all. Um, coercive control can look like 
regulating and um, controlling what a abused individual wears, how they dress, the kind of makeup they put on, how they do their hair, where they go, what they eat, what time they get home, um, uh, what types of friends they have, what types of hobbies they're allowed to enjoy. Um, so any sort of control that um, takes away a person's free will can be considered coercive control under this new law that was passed in January, 2021. Another example is destroying that person's personal property or making it unavailable to them or forcing an individual who's abused to pay for the abuser's rent or other financial obligations. Those can all be examples of coercive control. Again, we cannot give every possible example and there are some I'm sure our brains can't even think of or fathom at this moment, but given the breadth of all of these laws, most behavior could likely, that's abusive seeming, could likely fall into these protections or definitions. Okay, so we've talked about how you define domestic violence and abuse, the types of um, abuse that a person needs to suffer in order to um, be able to invoke the civil code section. So if you are a person who's experienced any of the things that we've talked about, and again, it doesn't need to be just in a relationship. It can also be if your roommate has subjected you to anything, including a violent you know, fight with your roommate, you could potentially um, invoke the civil code section 1946.7 to get out of your lease early. Um, so again, think broadly and, and not narrowly in this case, um, because it's more important that people believe that they can be covered by the law even if there's an unlikely scenario that they might not be, um, it's more important for them to know and believe that they can be covered by the law to try to invoke its protections. Because if you think, oh, well, this is not me, I'm not a victim, um, even though there are factors that you've experienced that demonstrate you are, you might not use this very important law to your benefit. And there, the financial consequences of not being able to use this law could be severe. So think broadly about its applicability in your specific situation. Um, so the, uh, let's see, um, the procedure for how to break your lease early under civil code section 1946.7. We mentioned earlier that the tenant has to inform their landlord in writing with at least 14 days notice of their intent to terminate their lease early. So again, the lease could be another year, another two year, another month. But if the tenant gives 14 days notice and then follows the proper documentation procedure that we'll talk about in a second, they are only on the hook for those 14 days of rent and not for any more. Um, so again, remember that you, you can't give notice and then immediately, immediately after you've given notice, you are no longer liable for rent. The tenant who gives notice under this civil code section must still pay rent for 14 days. If the tenant has already paid for that entire month of rent, the landlord should refund them the, the, on a pro rata basis, the days that they have already paid but won't be living in the unit anymore and are no longer liable to pay for the unit under civil code section 1946.7. So again, tenant must inform the landlord in writing with at least 14 days notice um, that they intend to break the lease because they have been a victim of one of the types of abuse um, that's listed under the civil code section. In writing traditionally would mean, uh, you know, snail mail, something sent via USPS. But if you regularly communicate with your landlord via email, that could satisfy the standard. But it is always best to be safe um, to send it via um, USPS certified mail so that you can prove it was. Um, delivered to his address. Um, and then you can also send a follow-up um, letter via email as well. Another thing is you can serve the landlord with this document in person too, and you know maybe take a, a picture of the moment or send a follow-up text message or email that says, just confirming I came to your office or I met you somewhere and hand delivered you um, my notice of intent to break the lease early under civil code section 1946.7. In order to avoid liability for the remainder of the lease term, it's important to be able to prove that you've met these procedural steps. So that's why it's important for the tenant to be able to prove 
the ways that they gave notice um, or that they did give notice of their intent to terminate early. So again, that's why it's important to do it in writing and have it be a provable way. Um, so if you, I would say email is generally not a good idea, but it can be possible if that's a common way that you communicate with the landlord. Um, text message can be the same thing. But again, the safest method is to send a physical written document by mail or via personal delivery. Um, so in addition to making that written disclosure or that written statement, the tenant must also provide one of the following forms of documentation. A police report showing the abuse occurred within the last 180 days. So the tenant has 180 days after a police report is made um, to invoke these protections if they're intending to use the police report as documentation um, of their right to break the lease early. They could show a restraining order or a protective order um, showing the abuse occurred within the last 180 days. And this includes even a temporary order. So if you don't have a permanent restraining order, which you know might take some time to get a hearing, a tenant could show a temporary order um, in order to invoke the right to break the lease early. A tenant could have a letter from a qualified third party um, as their form of documentation about why they're allowed to break the lease early under civil code section 1946.7. Um, and that the type of qualified uh, third party could be a domestic violence counselor, a doctor, um, a therapist, um, um, a, a police officer. Generally, it's not, you know, like a friend or a confidant, um, but and it's safest to get someone who has that sort of qualified, since it's a qualified third party, you might want someone who is qualified to assess and determine someone's mental health and whether they are victims of the types of abuse that we've talked about, um, which is covered under the civil code section. Um, and then the last type of way and type of documentation a tenant could use to um, support their right to break the lease early under civil code section 1946.7 is any type of documentation that reasonably, ver reasonably verifies that the act or, act or crime occurred. So again, another very broad concept, um, which really reflects the intent of the California legislature for this law to apply to as many people in as many circumstances as possible. So as long as you can find documentation that reasonably verifies that the act or crime occurred, that should be enough. So an example of that could be a contemporaneous text message to the landlord that says, hey, look, this just happened. Um, my roommate just attacked me. Here's the picture of the, the hole in the wall that was punched. That could potentially be a reasonable verification that uh, the act of crime occurred. So it's generally safest and more certain um, for the tenant to be able to cleanly use the civil code section if they have one of the three first um, uh, forms of documentation. But if you don't, you know, a lot of times when you're in the thick of this type of abuse, you might not have the presence and clarity of mind to get something like that. So that's why the fourth section is there. Any form of documentation that reasonably verifies the crime, the act or crime occurred um, so that you're not out of luck and your ability to break your lease early is not impaired just because you don't have these neat and tidy forms of documentation about the abuse you suffered. Okay, moving on. So sample language for early lease termination. Um, we want to provide that so that individuals who might need to use this termination of lease method have kind of clean and easy language that they could cite to. And as you can see, it's a really short letter, doesn't have to go into detail, but the tenant just provides sort of um, the exact language that's in the civil code section. So the landlord can't challenge it and then would provide that additional documentation in addition to the sample letter. Just linger here for a second. Okay, 
So after a tenant breaks their lease successfully under civil code section 1946.7, what happens? So the tenant has given their 14 days notice and proper documentation. Um, they've waited 14 days, they paid rent for those 14 days, and then they move out. What happens to your security deposit? Well, the security deposit code section, um, which is civil code 1950.5, still operates. So um, it operates in the same way as if the tenant did not have to break their lease early because they were a victim of some domestic violence or abuse or um, any sort of violent act. Um, and that is to say that the tenant, uh, the landlord has 21 days after the tenant moves out to either return a portion of the security deposit with documentation and receipts about why any portion of it was withheld or to return the whole security deposit. So again, 21 days from the date the tenant vacates. So that would be 14 days after they've given notice of their intent to move out under section 1947.6. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so 21 days after the tenant moves out of the property is when the security deposit um, either the whole thing or a portion of it should be returned. Um, if the landlord is with, withholding your whole security deposit to cover damage, there are methods that you can fight um, that sort of with, withdrawal or withholding. Um, so if the landlord withholds either the whole security deposit or a portion of it, there are ways to fight it. And that is a resource that HERA has available on its website. We have other webinars and workshops available that discuss in detail, the security deposit code section, um, what a landlord can withhold for, um, and the procedures to follow if you believe your landlord has wrongfully withheld. So related to the topic of breaking the lease early, the landlord cannot withhold your security deposit because they allege that you didn't pay rent for the remainder of your lease. Remember, the civil code section that we're talking about today, the one that gives tenants who have um, either been victims themselves or have family members or household members who were victims of these types of terrible um, types of violence or abuse, mental, emotional, physical, or financial. Um, the that Invoking that law gives the tenant the right to just move out within 14 days of notice. They are not on the hook for the remainder of the lease and for the landlord to withhold some of the security deposit to make up for some of the months of the lease that the tenant left before those months occurred is completely illegal and definitely grounds for the tenant to fight the landlord to get their security deposit back and maybe even to get a penalty against the landlord of up to two times their security deposit um, because of that bad faith withholding. And I think that would be a very good example of a case where the bad faith penalty should be awarded to the tenant because it's very clear that the civil code section that lets you break the lease does not let a landlord charge you for any amount of rent that follows that 14 day period where you've given notice. Of course, as long as the tenant, um, the civil code section applies to the tenant um, and they've given the proper procedure, they follow the proper procedure and given the proper notice and documentation to break the lease. Okay, and once the tenant is in a new tenancy, they have the right to have their new address be kept confidential. They can enroll in an address confidentiality or mail forwarding program to obtain a PO box so that they don't need to list um, their new physical residence as their address. And this PO box will be offered free of charge. So um, to do that, they can enroll through the California Safe at Home program information related to that program and how to register for it is provided there. The individual can also request a court order that prohibits their abuser from taking steps to learn their new address. Um, and so the court order can not only you know, prohibit the abuser from contacting the tenant, but it can be as specific as this to prevent the abuser from even trying to find out the address for the um, individual they are abusing. Um, the individual, if they're the abused individual, if they're looking to file, you know, court documents and paperwork to protect themselves and their family, they can, instead of listing their new residence, can list the address of a trusted family member or friend, or they could write something like confidential um, in an address box per family code section 6203 in any court documentation. So 
a, a victim who um, has a new residence that they want to keep private and confidential, particularly from their abuser, is allowed to avoid uh, revealing or disclosing that address, even on court, formal court documents. Um, and related to the security deposit, which we just discussed, they can provide to the landlord their new, um, the address of a friend or a trusted family member instead of their new address. If they want to make sure that there is no um, evidence of their new address anywhere in the world, that might be a good option as well. All right, well, our resources that are available, um, the Sacramento Law Library has various resources which are available here on your screen, as well as, well as HERA, um, Housing and Economic Rights Advocates. Um, if you need to talk to a lawyer about this particular topic or about a whole host of topics, I'll share um, HERA's general areas of assistance in the next screen. Um, and that could, um, and please get in touch with us if this workshop and the um, issues we discussed today speak to a situation that you or someone you know is in, or if you're having issues related to any of these services that I that I have listed up on the screen. Hera is, again, a um, not-for-profit legal services and law firm, California statewide law firm. Um, so hopefully you can find um, if you have an issue, hopefully it's something that we can help you out with. And even if it isn't, we'll definitely make a referral to another organization that can. So I will double check to see if we have any questions before we move on. Doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, the last thing I will say is that we have a link to our a survey um, related to this workshop, which is available in the chat box, um, as well as a question and answer box. Any individuals who have attended, if you could um, fill out the survey, we would be very, very appreciative. Let us know how you found um, the workshop. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to call either the Law Library or Hera. And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and um, is able, if the issues we talked about in this webinar apply to you, is able to use the information to ensure a safe and, um, and sound future. Thanks so much. Take care.